Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Katie Bailey. I am a neuroradiologist affiliated with the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. I've been an attending neuroradiologist for the last 11 years and I am fellowship trained and CAQ'd. I hope you enjoy my temporal bone lectures and I hope you enjoy many more lectures to come. Thanks. Today we're going to discuss the adult temporal bone and specifically normal anatomy of the temporal bone. The goal is a less than 10 minute high yield review of normal anatomy of the temporal bone so you can impress your attending at the workstation. When I read temporal bones, especially looking for normal anatomy, I like the outside in approach and specifically on the coronal view. So the first thing that you're looking for is patency of the external auditory canals. You'd like to see the cartilaginous portion as well as the bony portion. There should be a thin layer of mucosa extending along the surface of the bony portion. As you can see here on the left side, you see that mucosa also extending along the roof. The bony external auditory canal ends with the scutum, which is the sharp piece of bone at the end to which the tympanic membrane is attached. So your main question with this, is the external auditory canal patent? Is there any abnormal soft tissue in there? Those are the questions to ask about the external auditory canals. Next, we get to the middle ear cavity. So you have the tympanic membrane, which should be so thin that you can't measure it. It should just be a thin, wispy little bit of soft tissue, as you see here. On the tympanic membrane, you see the long arm of the malleus. If you remember from physical diagnosis class, that's called the umbo when you look into the ear, but it's actually the long arm of the malleus. Up here above the scutum and between the scutum and the ossicles is called Prusak space. It's just this aerated portion above the scutum. This is the classic place where acquired cholesteatomas begin. So that is a place to look for any abnormal soft tissue. The middle ear cavity should only contain ossicles and air. There should not be any soft tissue in it. Here's the scutum on the left side as well. Nice and sharp. Middle ear cavity is roughly divided into three segments. You have the epitympanum, which is above the ossicles, also called the roof of the tympanic cavity. You have the mesotympanum, which roughly corresponds to where the ossicles are. And you have the hypotympanum, which is below the ossicles to the bone. So epi above, meso middle, hypo below. Above the epitympanum, you have the tegmin tympani, which is the bony roof of the middle ear cavity. The left side, hypotympanum, mesotympanum, epitympanum, tegmin tympani. The next thing I like to look for on the coronal views is the foot place of the stapes going into the oval window. So you wanna see that jutting of bone pointing into the oval window on the right side. Here it is on the left side. Next, you extend from the middle ear cavity to the mastoids through the aditus ad antrum. So this is the mastoid antrum. It's just where the air should connect from the middle ear cavity to the mastoid air cells. You'd like to see multiple air-filled mastoid air cells with bony trabecula. There should not be any soft tissue within the mastoid air cells. You'd also like to see an intact roof of the mastoids. So this is the tegmin mastoidium. So on both sides, you want to see, are there aerated mastoid air cells? Is there a roof of the mastoids on both sides? Next, we have the inner ear, which contains the cochlea and the semicircular canals. The cochlea looks like a snail. It has two and a half turns, the basal turn and the apical turn. The diameter of the turn should be approximately the same. The cochlea should be surrounded by bright cortical bone. The part of the bone that juts towards the middle ear cavity is called the cochlear promontory. You should have three semicircular canals, the superior semicircular canal, the lateral or horizontal semicircular canal, and the inferior semicircular canal. The canal should be approximately the same diameter. They should exhibit low density and there should be cortical covering of all of the semicircular canals. On the coronal, you can best see the roof of the superior semicircular canal, and you wanna make sure that there is cortical bone between that superior semicircular canal and the middle cranial fossa. 
the internal auditory canal, there isn't much you can comment on a CT of the temporal bones. You would like to see that there is an internal auditory canal and that it's approximately similar in caliber throughout its course. You'd like to see cortical bone on the superior and inferior aspects of it. You don't want to see any bone erosion, any expansion, or any bone destruction. So just on the coronal views, look and make sure you have internal auditory canals. They're approximately the same size on both sides. The facial nerve canal, I find my residents get the most confused about. I like to start on the coronal view, looking at the stylomastoid foramen, which is the opening at the bottom of the mastoid bone. There should not be any other openings. This is where the facial nerve comes out. So after, one, after you find where it comes out, then follow it back to its origin. So follow the facial nerve canal throughout its course, extending superiorly. It makes a turn, keeps turning, goes underneath the lateral semicircular canal. Here's the portion that's adjacent to the middle ear cavity, extending up to the genicula ganglion. The genicula ganglion is a triangle shape of low density superior to the cochlea. So you'd like to make sure that the bone is intact throughout the course of the facial nerve canal. You would like the genicula ganglion to be small and separate from the roof of the mastoid cavity. So you'd like to see cochlea, cortical bone, genicula ganglion, and then mastoid air cells or just roof of the mastoid cavity above the genicula ganglion. And you do this on both sides. On, on the field view, I like to get a better look at the ossicles and specifically the ice cream cone appearance of the ossicles. So you see in the middle ear, you have the malleo-incutal joint, so you have the ice cream on top of the cone. When you have disruption of that joint, you can have widening of it, or you can actually see the ice cream falling off the cone. So on any head CT where you can see the ossicles, especially in the case of trauma, and especially on temporal bone CTs, make sure your ice cream is all on top of the cone on both sides. So normal on the right, normal on the left. Ice cream on top of the cone, the malleo joint. The other thing I'd like to look at, especially on the axial views, is called the fissula antifenestrum, and that's the cortical bone between the cochlea and the semicircular canals. So the cortical bone around the cochlea is where you find otosclerosis, also called otospongiosis, depending if you want to use the imaging term or the pathology term. So you want to make sure this bone is bright and cortical. When you get otosclerosis, you get an appearance of more spongy bone, so the bone becomes more hypodense, like you see here at the Petra's apex. So on the axial view, especially when you're screening patients that have hearing loss, make sure you have cortical bone between the cochlea and the semicircular canals, as well as all the way around the cochlea. So this area, the fissula antifenestrum. The other thing that you have to look for on a CT of the temporal bones is everything outside of the temporal bone. Remember, you're responsible for any findings in the brain, including strokes, masses, hydrocephalus, cerebellar tonsillar herniation. So make sure whatever images are submitted to you that you look for everything outside of the temporal bone. You could potentially see masses at these cerebellopontine angles. You can see sinusitis, which can be a cause of perceived hearing loss because if anybody's had a sinus infection, your head feels very fuzzy and sounds appear dampened. So I comment on what I can see of the posterior cranial fossa. I comment on the paranasal sinuses, especially if there's sinus disease. The orbits, you can usually see portion of the globes as well as the sense of the orbits. You can see in the nasal cavity, you can look for polyps, masses. You can see portion of the parotid glands. In fact, one of the things I find is most missed on head CTs or temporal bone CTs are incidental parotid masses. So don't forget to look at the parotid glands when you're looking at a temporal bone CT. Also look for the soft tissue in the nasopharynx on the axial and sagittal views. Make sure you're not missing a mass in the nasopharynx that's causing problems with the temporal bone, especially if you see a unilateral mastoid effusion, something that's persistent, always check the nasopharynx 
specifically the fossa of Rosenmuller and that torus tuberius, as well as the midline looking for lymphoma, especially in the midline, and squamous cell carcinomas of the nasopharynx, which tend to originate in that fossa of Rosenmuller. So to summarize, I like to start with the coronal images looking at normal anatomy from the outside in. I also look at the coronal images for the extras, the facial nerve canals, the internal auditory canals, etc. Axials for the final review, especially of the ossicles and the cortical bone around the cochlea, and then look for everything outside of the temporal bone that's included. Thank you for your attention.